Well, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. This is Pastor Whitfield Harrington, and I want to welcome you out tonight to the Whitfield Harrington Show. This is a show where we take a look at things that are going on in our natural world, and we try to see things through a set of spiritual lenses. So as always, let me begin with a prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this moment of instruction and lesson that you have blessed us to partake in one more time. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's that time of the year. Amen. It's that time of the season. Um, it's election season. And we are in the final hours of this election season here in the United States of America. And a lot of things are at stake. A lot of things are at stake. A lot of people have a lot of things on their mind. Um, you're hearing a lot of things, and people have their perspective about this and their perspectives about that. But I want to introduce a different perspective and some of the issues that are facing us in this election. We often hear from politicians and their perspectives, what if I told you that there is a spiritual perspective that is so deep that it may change the way you think about politics altogether. Let's bring up one of the most controversial topics in American politics, which you hear being talked about now, which is abortion. People have their view of abortion. And for years I had my view. Um, then I experienced something that really made me think about abortion in a different light. Let me explain something to you that happened to me maybe about five years ago. Five years ago, I was doing a counseling session with a mother and daughter, and unknowing to me, they were driving down the road. And as they were driving down the road, the Lord said to me, pray. So I just told them, this was probably the second counseling session I'd had with them. And I noticed that whenever I had a session with them, it was always something <laughs> supernatural that occurred. So I just started praying. And immediately I heard the mother screaming and I heard another person screaming. There were apparently three people in the car. The mother was driving, daughter was on the back seat, daughter was on the front seat. And it turns out the daughter on the front seat had fallen over in some type of contorted, I guess, way. And she started shaking violently. And I could hear the mother and the daughter screaming, trying to get control of this young lady of what was going on. So all of a sudden, a voice starts coming from this young girl's mouth. Mind you, this is happening while I'm on the phone, so I can't see, but I can hear this going across, you know, the Bluetooth in the car. A spirit starts talking out of the voice of this young lady's mouth. And it's saying these words, she's mine. She's mine. She's mine. She belongs to me. And I'm saying, oh boy, here we go. This is the first time in my life that I have dealt with a talking spirit like this. It's on the telephone and they're in a car. So I really have to trust God now, all right? So I began to go through some of the things that I've learned over the years, even though I hadn't experienced it. I have seen other people deal with it. And I begin to ask that spirit, what is your name? And the spirit tells me its name is the queen of the Colts. Okay. Then I ask it, what is your right to be here? This spirit says to me, man of God, what is your business in this matter? She gave us the blood of her firstborn. what 
This spirit is saying, man of God, what is your business in this matter? She gave us the blood of her firstborn. She belongs to us. So I'm not trying to hear it. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm just pressing forward with the deliverance. So I command that spirit to go away and find out who's in charge. Call the ruling spirit up. The ruling spirit comes up. And the ruling spirit comes up when I command it to come up. He came up and says, oh, man of God, you had no right to call me up. She belongs to us. She gave us the blood of her firstborn. So I'm, I'm puzzled for a moment, but I think I'm putting A and B together. Then it finally hits me why they keep saying she gave us the blood of her firstborn. You know what they were referring to? She had had an abortion. She aborted her firstborn child. And if anybody knows the scriptures fairly decent, you know that the child that comes out of the womb first is a consecrated child unto the Lord, especially if it's a male. So it took about 45 minutes for that deliverance session to get through all of it. Turns out, to make a long story short, she had a boyfriend who was into witchcraft. And he was upset that she aborted the child, so he started issuing curses against her. And this is how these spirits came into her life. And one particular spirit, which was the door opening spirit, was a spirit of torment. So that was a spirit of torment that came with the shedding of the blood of the firstborn or with an abortion. And once all of those spirits had been bound and cast out, immediately I could hear the mother and the sister saying that her appearance changed suddenly. It's like her skin lightened up three shades immediately. So oftentimes we think of abortion from a politician's point of view. But that day I learned a demon's point of view. They saw abortion as the shedding of innocent blood. They saw it as a person making a sacrifice unto them, unto evil spirits. Their words to me and those who were in the car was she gave us the blood of her firstborn. Those words still resonate in my spirit. Even when I see now politicians standing on stage and they have made the centerpiece of their election, giving the blood of babies to demons. I know this is, this is what's going on in our real world, but we're seeing it through a set of spiritual lenses. And we need to understand and comprehend that there are things that we see in the natural that God is going to pull back the cloak and allow us to catch a glimpse of what is happening in the spirit. You see, it is the shedding of innocent blood that first happens in the book of Genesis. And because of the shedding of the innocent blood of Cain, I'm sorry, of Abel, by his brother Cain, the Bible tells us that when Cain killed Abel, that the Lord said that the earth had opened up her mouth to receive your brother's blood. See that? Even in the beginning of time, the shedding of innocent blood, you can see the earth opening up its mouth spiritually to receive blood. So we see these things happening and we celebrate them but do we really understand the spiritual implications behind them? I don't think we do, but we need to know. And I know people have their political preferences and you vote for this and you vote for that, but now you know, all right? You can't say you not know because you've heard. You may not believe, but at least you've heard that there is something that's going on deeper than what meets the eye. Years ago, there was an old movie that was put out called The Wizard of Oz. 
and you know Dorothy, um, the Scarecrow, the Tin Man, and the old Cowardly Lion, and don't forget about Toto, were on their way to see the Wizard of Oz. And when they finally got to see the Wizard of Oz and they saw all of the fire and they saw all of the smoke, and then little Toto ran over and began to pull back the curtain, and they saw there was a man behind the curtain, and and then he screams, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. This is what's happening in our world today. And God is exposing and pulling back the curtain. But you will find people in the media, even people in ministry, that would tell you, pay no attention to that man behind the curtain. Meaning, don't pay any attention to the truth or to the spirituality that is in place or that is in action that's going on in the world now. We need to see what's truly behind the scene. What's truly behind these candidates? Hmm? Why is it that one particular party in this country is constantly crying out for the continuation of giving blood to demons? And they call it a right. They call it a choice. They call it reproductive rights. But I have seen, I have heard with my own ears that demonic forces refer to it as giving blood to them, which gives them the right to come in and to do all sorts of wicked things in a person's life, to bring curses on the land, and you see, it is the shedding of innocent blood. The Bible tells us the first king in the Bible, Saul, he killed some Gibeonites out of spite. Even though there was a covenant between the children of Israel and the Gibeonites. And because of that, it created a famine in the land for three years, long after Saul had killed those people. So what is this? This is showing us that the decisions we make today, they affect another generation. When it comes to politics, the decisions that are made in the political arena today, you will begin to see the effects, true effects of it 20, 30, 40 years from now. You can see the things that are happening, um, whether it's with immigration. You can see the things that happen, whether it's with taxation. The policies that they make today, you see the long-term effects happening 20, 30, 40 years from now. And so what has been happening is we've only been focusing on the physical effects, not recognizing and realizing that there are also spiritual effects behind those policies as well. And now we're beginning to see almost an unprecedented moment in history to where we're at a crossroads as a nation. And we feel that we must turn in a certain direction. Everybody, every politician is always saying a new way forward. Listen to me. For which, where are we going? All right. Don't tell me we're going forward. Tell me where are we going because your direction of and your definition of forward may be backwards for me. If you're going north and I'm going south, then your forward is backwards for me. So we need to define where we want to go as a nation. And we need to see the spiritual ramifications, not just of this election, but beyond. There are forces at work. Let me tell you, I believe the people of God are praying, but we need to continue to pray. And you need to continue to be led by God to vote. If the Amish people are coming out, registering to vote, that should tell you something. They can see the spiritual implications that are in place in this election. And for so many people, all we see is just the politicians. All we see is, is the red and blue. Let me tell you. If God opens your eyes and allow you to see behind the curtain, see the man behind the curtain, the woman behind the curtain, you would be shocked. It probably would scare you twice as straight as you already are. 
to see the wickedness that exists in our world today in its raw form, to see the agenda of the enemy in its raw form. And you have to learn how to address it spiritually. It's one thing to, to, to express yourself and to get on TV, radio, internet, and say A, B, C, D, E, F, G. But let me tell you, I have learned through bitter tears. It's another thing to keep your mouth closed before people, but pray to God in secret. And let God which seeth in secret reward you open. Meaning, being strategic in prayer, knowing how to pray what really matters, and then leaving the rest up to God. Because I'm going to tell you, you can pour out your heart trying to campaign for people. You can fast and pray and hoping that things will change. And it reminds me of the life of Jeremiah. Jeremiah was there and he was prophesying and warning the people that if they didn't get it right with the Lord, that he was going to judge them. And he went on and on and on and on. And they still didn't listen. And God had to deal with them. So sometimes being in that role of a seer and an intercessor, it's not happy, happy, joy, joy. It's a matter of sharing what God shares with you. And then recognizing that people have to make a decision themselves. My concern in this election, it's not the election itself. It's not how we vote. It's rather how we count our votes. When you rely on technology to do things for you, you're easily subjected to the person's intellectual capacity who programs the technology to do things for you. In other words, if you don't use a calculator and you use your hand, you don't have to worry about the calculator misleading you or giving you a false result. But if things are done by hand, that minimizes the risk of being deceived by technology. Be wise and read in between the lines. Because there are things that I see going on that are already, quote unquote, rigged. And it's unfortunate, but it is what it is. It is my prayer that it is a free and fair election. Just let the people vote. The way your heart is before God is the way you should vote. And let God judge us according to that. But if we are not careful as a nation in this crossroad, I'm concerned, I truly am concerned that sometimes it may be in the best interest of a people to let God deal with them. And let me tell you, I say that through tremendous, <laughs> I don't even know the proper word, anguish. You see, there was a, a moment when God brought the children of Israel out of Egypt and they had made God so mad that God told Moses, stand back, I'm going to destroy all of them and I'm going to start over with you and I'm going to raise up a new people. And Moses fell on his face and began to cry out unto God and began to compel God, Lord, do not destroy these people. They would say, you brought them out of Egypt, but you were not able to deliver them and they all died in the wilderness. And because of that, God spared them. But Moses, the one who was crying out for them, he didn't even make it to the promised land. So what if he had to just stood back and let God did what he wanted to do? I know that's, that, that's a very, you know, <laughs> powerful statement. If God wanted to just destroy them and start over, and what if Moses had to say, there they go, do as you choose. And sometimes the wickedness you see in the world as an intercessor, it makes you think, <laughs> am I really, <laughs> Lord, doing good? Am I really doing right by 
asking you to keep having mercy. I have to take, I take myself back and down memory lane. You know, my father and my mother were very strong disciplinarians and there was a once a time in this country where you were allowed to discipline your children without, you know, the government standing over your shoulder ready to throw you in jail because you screamed at them or you spanked them. But in those days when I was growing up, there were times when mother would talk to father and, and, and would compel him to have mercy and he would restrain himself and he would restrain himself and he would restrain himself. And then finally he would say, no, 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 no. I got to deal with him now. And this is my prayer. So pray with me and for me because I'm under the impression that we may be at a point historically where the wickedness that we see in the world, I don't know, it may need a good <laughs> spanking from our Heavenly Father. But then we know, as the Bible says, that in the book of Revelation, in the end times, all of these things will begin to happen to people and that people still wouldn't repent. So that makes me wonder, despite what may happen in this coming election and afterwards, where should our focus be? Let me tell you, you should focus more on the things now that will matter the most when everything is over. I've learned to just run my race, stay in my lane, not try to police everybody, not try to be a quality controlled inspector for someone else's salvation, someone else's ministry, someone else's platform, but to stay in my lane and to do what God has called me to do. Because in the midst of what's going on and the wickedness in the world and the, and the, absence of spiritual discernment amongst the body of Christ. You see a lot of infighting among Christians and nobody really seems to know what's about to happen. I'll say this as I close because I was in prayer a few days ago and the Holy Spirit said something to me that almost made me suddenly cry. The Holy Spirit said, my people are not ready for what lies ahead. Mm. My people are not ready for what lies ahead. So what have we gotten ourselves busy doing? Trying to go back to, I guess, the, the pre-9-11 years or the pre-2020 years when we are in end times. This life that we live is almost over as we know it. Things will never be the same again. And here the Spirit of the Lord was telling me after fasting and praying that my people are not ready. It's a lot to digest. But I think we all need to take a step back and ask ourselves, if the Lord had came back, the rapture occurred 20 minutes ago, would you still be here or would you be taken away? If your life had ended yesterday, not tomorrow, yesterday, what condition would you have faced God? Would you be able to hear God say, well done? Or would he utter those words, depart from me? That is what I am shifting my focus to. Regardless of how crazy the world may get, your mind needs to be on finishing the course that the Lord has called you to start. Running the race that he has given to you staying in your lane and doing the things that he's assigned for you to do. And let me say this. I say this wholeheartedly. I see a lot of ministers, some old, primarily young, they're busy beating up one another, busy beating up one another's platform, picking this person apart, picking that person apart. I started to do that once. And let me tell you what the spirit of the Lord said to me. 
I did not call you to be a quality control inspector to someone else's ministry. Mind your business. I will deal with them. Let's get out of this self-destructive mentality of tearing down someone else. If you have a problem, I'll say a quick prayer for you and I move on. But I cannot act as if I raise you in ministry and you are now out of order according to the way I've raised you in my house. That's not the case. We need to grow up beyond that. And we need to all be called back to the place of prayer because the body of Christ as a whole, we're not ready. We're not ready. It's a sad reality. But may God give us grace. And I pray that God will give us time to get ready. Time to get ready. Because we need it. We need time to get ready. I'm going to pray tonight. Pray that God will give us discernment. That God's hand would be on this nation as we choose in this election. That God's hand would even be involved in the counting of ballots. That God will see us through this season. And if he so chooses to give us time to get ready for what lies ahead. Father, we pray right now in the name of Jesus. We come unto you, Lord, because we need your divine intervention in this nation and the nations around the world, Lord. We look to you now in the name of Jesus. As we pray, oh God, we pray for discernment in this election, that we can see beyond the smoke and the screen, oh God, and see the individual behind the curtain, to see the spirits that are at work, to see where your hand lies and where your will is, oh God, and not be ashamed, oh God, to move in that direction. Father, we pray for a free and fair election and that the workers of iniquity who desire and have designed things, O oh God, as to be stolen or read, would be brought to open shame in the name of Jesus, that their efforts would be dwarfed and blocked in the name of Jesus as we pray now. And Father, I pray that you would dispatch angels over this nation to oversee, O oh God, and to enforce your word and your will according to this prayer in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray right now, yes, that you would help us and have mercy on us where we are still lacking, where we are still in need, that you would give us the grace and the time that we need, O oh God, to get ourselves together. O oh Lord, help us. Have mercy on us. Help us to discern your will, O oh God, and to do your will. Give us the grace to continue in the race that you have called us to run. And these blessings we thank you for as we give you all the glory and the honor now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, that's about all the time that I have for this week. As I normally say around this time, saints, it's time for us to stop playing and start praying. God bless you and I'll see you next time.